Ah, that was serious. Hello, fellow chain gangers. Let's explore some principles of blade geometry by designing and building a sweet, sweet chopper. You know me, just me and my Lambo chopping in the woods, because knowledge. But well, how did I get here? Tinkering with knife design. So without further ado, let's build a prototype. At this point, I normally open up Inkscape and start vector drawing stuff, but I want to show you a few things. First, it's this iPhone app that allowed me to doodle some vector format drawings while I was traveling to Florida recently. It can export some useful formats, has decent functionality, but it's tedious to work with, especially when there's a desktop available. Check below for a link to that. I think it's seven or eight bucks. I'm not affiliated with that. And this is just some free advice. Next is a web-based design program at knifeprint.com. There's some very good beginner level tutorial videos that are brief, effective, and to the point for a quick start, and some advanced level videos are coming soon. The hyper complex layout and innumerable buttons one finds in typical vector software has been whittled down uh, to the necessities in a simple but powerful interface. I got it all done with the basic set of uh, uh, tools seen here. Files can be exported in several formats like DXF, PNG, and PDF. If you don't want to start from scratch, they have available knife designs for you to import, make changes to, then call your own. They offer a laser cutting service. I'll let you know more about a quote I got later on in this video. Anyway, move that there. Yeah, we need drill holes. So the site has a very nice drill hole tool where you make the hole, then you manually type in its dimension for a sweet, sweet precision. You can see rulers sort of popping up and off the screen. They help keep things centered. And yeah, there's a super, super slick tool for skeletonizing the handles. I'll show you that a bit later. It's, it's really awesome. You can check the link below to sign up at knifeprint.com. You can get a free account or paper for, for the professional version. Using that link really helps the channel. So think about that. So we'll print out our design cut it out and get it traced onto some steel here in a minute. You can see this first design doesn't really feel right in my hand. The handle's too thin. So I altered it and printed a second draft to use. I think it's much better. So prepare for that supreme sweet, sweet choppy choppy. Got that blue dicum. So listen, if you're interested in knifeprint.com, check for a link below. Use the promo code GREENBEETLE in all caps for an additional 10% off a professional membership if you choose to get a professional membership. By the way, signing up again from that link does really help the channel. So if you decide to sign up down the road, come back and click this link and then do it maybe. I wouldn't recommend the site if I didn't like it and I didn't use it. And I really do like it and I really do use it. All right, let's get into the meat of this video. I really, really like choppers and the concept of this sort of do all survival knife used to fascinate me. And that's sort of the, the context, the overall picture we're coming at this project from. Nine years ago when my interest in knives began, I sort of skeptically bought into the notion that a knife could be made that would do everything. But after a few years of sort of playing with knives and stewing on the notion, it was really clear that such an animal did not exist. So I came to call the do-all survival knife the Sasquatch knife because nut jobs claim to have seen it in the woods and it's a figment of our imagination. Well, what did our fur trapping forefathers settle North America with? Mm, Google the Nesmuk Trio for an idea. It wasn't one blade. So, you know, after a beef period of maturing, I was able to let go of that notion. But the concept is a great platform to deep dive into blade geometry. Recently, we explored the chef knife or slicing blade in a video, and I learned a great deal about that. So now it's time to complicate that issue a little more and explore the boundary between choppers and working knives. There's more to this issue than blade geometry, by the way. If we want a knife that slices and dices as well as chops, we'll have to consider things like weight, profile, handle design. So now let's start this experiment again with the grown up, no stinking fun reality acknowledgement that a knife that is good at all tasks and does everything does not exist. All right, before we heat treat, I'm going to get most of the bevels ground in. By the way, this is 80 CRV2. It's a 1080 type steel. It's more of a tool steel though. It's got a little chromium and vanadium in there. 
And I'm a little late to the ADC RV2 party, but it's my new favorite forging steel. And this will be a good chance to check out its performance with edge holding and durability. Here I'm drilling holes to decrease the weight of the handle, but KnifePrint.com's got you covered with a sweet, sweet skeletonizing tool. For those who are going to have their designs cut or machined, you can see here that it's generated a broken red line at a distance you choose from the tang border uh, that you can snap other line nodes to and skeletonize the tang with. I just think that's like super slick. All right, more about blade geometry. So the thinner our knife and the thinner our edge, the better a slicer it will be. Not only that, but the harder the steel and the thinner the sharpening angle, the better the edge retention will be. All of these things favor a chef knife. We're not going to get much chopping done with a thin little chef knife, are we? And we, we definitely want a slightly softer heat treat on something we're going to be smashing around than you would find on a chef knife. We could make a large thin blade like the time-tested and honored machete which has been chopping vegetation, tree limbs, and clearing fields for centuries, but because of its length it's a little bit unwieldy and I'm not sure it really fits the bill for slicing and dicing. So here our knife is going into steel foil, we'll thermal cycle it, it's annealed, then we want to get it normalized, then we'll heat treat it from 1525 degrees, quenching it in professional uh, medium speed quench oil. So we don't want something as thin as a chef knife. We're not after a big, large machete. We're going to make something shorter and fatter to maintain the weight needed for chopping. Our material starts at a quarter inch thick, which is pretty thick. Not an auspicious start for something we want to do slicing with, but our blade is wide enough and our primary bevel grind line is going to be pushed up from the edge towards the spine over one and a quarter inches, making the primary bevel angle narrower, which means our overall slicing and cutting geometry might be okay. This is it coming out of the tempering oven at 400 degrees for an hour and a half twice. I tried a lower temperature temper on my first ADC RV2 knives, but at 390 degrees, the cycles left for my knives at a HRC of about 63 to 64, which is definitely too hard for this chopper. So we've upped the temperature a bit to get it closer to 60 and just under. Here I'm going to draw back the spine with this torch to more of a spring type temper. I got a quote from KnifePrint.com for getting 20 of those skeletonized knife blanks laser cut out in ADC RV2, and they offered me free shipping to the U.S. for about $14 per blank, which includes the steel. With shipping, I think it'd be about 18 bucks per blank, but uh, I've never priced laser or water jet cutting before, so I can't say how competitive that price is, but, you know, the cost of steel alone here in the U.S., that's about 10 bucks per knife. And, you know, grit, no matter what you use, what method, you're probably a buck or two of grit into each of those knives, then there's your time. What's your time worth tracing them, cutting them out, profiling, drilling holes and fasteners and weight reduction? Uh, is this 20 to 40 minutes of your day per blank? You know, So if your time is worth 30 bucks per hour, that's 10 to $20 in cost per blank. If you're doing a significant quantity, like there's no doubt the money saving is there for having your blanks machined or lasered or water jetted or something. So I agree with the Knife Talk podcast on this. They talked about this recently. Cutting out blanks is not an art or a skill. And, you know, you, so no one should really feel like the, li the, the knife is no longer 100% handmade. Any, any monkey can, can profile a knife on a grinder.
Our edge is coming down to about 20 thousandths before sharpening. This is a bit thinner than you would want for most choppers. So we're sacrificing some strength, again, for slicing ability. It is still, however, about 10 thousandths or so wider than a typical chef knife at the edge. By the way, this is a prototype knife, so we're not going to do all the sort of fit and finish things that we would normally do on the blade. We're just going to be banging it around anyway. So we've talked a little bit about the primary bevel. What about the secondary bevel? With the help of this angle finder, we're putting a 17 degree per side edge on the knife. Most chopping blades are around 25 to 30 degrees per side. Most chef knives are in the sort of 10 to 15 degrees per side. Again, we're striking a middle ground with 17 degrees. Hopefully the toughness of our ADCR V2 will allow us to make an edge this thin that still holds up to a lot of dynamic abuse. Oh, but Steve, it's still too thin, you're saying. And I think you're right, which is why I'm bringing out my secret weapon, the 25-degree micro bevel. This is called sharpening your sharpening. It's basically a thin strip of increased angle at the apex of our edge to make it last longer, I hope. It's sort of like, you know, I think of it as Gary Busey's Outer Helmet Protector Protector. So here's our edge under a microscope. From left to right, there's the micro bevel, then in the middle, the secondary bevel or the edge, and then on the right, the primary bevel. Speaking of the primary bevel, what's our angle of primary bevel? So in this case, the width of the steel at the spine is 0.235 inches because I did some grinding on our quarter inch stock. Near the Ricasso, the length or the width of that bevel is one and one quarter inches. Towards the tip, it's closer to one and a half inches. If we plug that into a triangle calculator, we get the primary bevel angle being about 10.8 degrees near the Ricasso, and towards the tip, it's down to nine degrees. Well, now there's a few little hangers in there, but that's all right. I'm going to get them stropped out, and we'll do some choppy choppy next.
All right, well, that's a wrap. Let's take it back to the garage. We'll put it back through some testing on some sharpness stuff. I haven't done anything to it at this point. I have not stropped it. I haven't touched it. This is as it came off the wood. Murray Carter's three-finger test tells me it's lost a step, but it still hangs a fingernail pretty good. Let's take it to some paper. Regular paper goes okay. Let's try the newsprint paper. Well, it's not quite new. It's magazine, whatever that. It's not newsprint. It's whatever's between that and, yeah, it's stuff, okay? It's just stuff. So it definitely has lost a step on this paper. I think that's to be expected. Still does pretty good though. Still shaves arm hair. So let's see what happens if we strop it. I think if I put it on the strop for maybe 30 seconds or so here and we take it back to the paper, we'll see a pretty big difference. So I'm going to take it back to this grapefruit. I haven't done anything more to it than what you saw. It's off the wood with 30 seconds of stropping. And we'll see. And we'll just see what it does. I don't have any tomatoes. This is all I have. I don't think this is particularly a sharpness issue, although it definitely could be sharper. I think it's sort of a blade geometry issue, and then I don't really have any skills with knives, kitchen knives. <laughs> so that's part of this too. After some practice, it'll pick up a little bit, but I think the limiting factor here is geometry. So pick and choose, pick and choose. When you get one thing, you're usually giving up something else. All right, so that's it. I'm going to call this thing the leaf cutter because that's such a fun name. This is a fun project and I'll learn so much. You know, I think exploring these things on your own is just really important in knife making. I hope you guys who are making knives are taking time to do some of these things and really sort of push these boundaries and figure out what works and what doesn't for you, what steels are good and what aren't and, and heat treating and all that stuff. Remember, there's fun in knife making. It's okay to be creative as long as you understand where fun and function meet and then diverge. It's all good.